Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Alexander DeSanctis of National Review is in for Jim Garrity, who's on his way back today from the Koch Brothers Conference out in Palm Springs. Jim will be back on Wednesday. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives. And I want to put out a disclaimer at the beginning here. We do not plan to make the possible independent presidential bid of Howard Schultz the good martini every single day. But it is the good martini again today. At least he's part of the good martini. And that's because uh, we can start popping some popcorn. Alexandra, the Democrats are getting a little nervous. Uh, they don't like Howard Schultz thinking about an independent bid. Uh, he's plenty liberal. He could run as a Democrat. But uh, even a liberal like him is worried that the party's too far left for him to even have a shot. So that's why he's considering an independent run. But now he and Elizabeth Warren are at loggerheads over Warren's wealth tax. Howard Schultz was a guest of Steve Inskeep on Morning Edition uh, just today. And here is what he had to say about Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax, uh, trying to impose a 2% tax on everything anyone owns over a grand total of $50 million. And it goes to 3% if you're worth more than a billion. But here's Howard Schultz on that. You know, what what we have today is an unfair system. However, when I see Elizabeth Warren uh, come out with, you know, a ridiculous plan of taxing wealthy people a surtax of 2% because it makes a good headline or sends out a tweet when she knows for a fact that's not something that's ever going to be passed, this is what's wrong. I mean, you, you can't just attack these things in a punitive way by punishing people. Well, Elizabeth Warren's not taking that lying down. Just about an hour later, she tweeted out, and it's sad that it's a tweet because her hushed, outraged voice would make this so much better. But it says, what's ridiculous is billionaires who think they can buy the presidency to keep the system rigged for themselves while opportunity slips away for everyone else. The top 0.1% who would pay my ultra-millionaire tax, own about the same wealth as 90% of America. It's time for change. So, Alexandra, I'm sure if Howard Schultz was not thinking about a presidential run and he was just a big, rich, liberal donor, she'd be more than happy to uh, take his check. But uh, the fact that he's uh, making things a little bit nervous for for Democrats is kind of fun here. And he's actually right about the fact that uh, her plan is pie in the sky. Oh, I think Howard Schultz is saying something that Democratic voters really don't want to hear right now. And certainly Democratic uh, primary candidates don't want someone to be saying because they all want to be competing to make the best possible promises to their primary voters, things that they think these uh, their constituents want to hear. And they probably do. Everybody likes the sound of, you know, taking money from the rich so they can get more free stuff. Um, but I think you're, what you're seeing with Schultz is he's willing to say things that other Democrats won't because he's not running as a Democrat. And on top of that, he's sort of a, you know, he's obviously a, a woke corporation head, um, former corporation head, and he uh, is very progressive on social issues. But I think when it comes to economics, he's not necessarily all the way on the left as far as they'd like. And uh, it's raising some uncomfortable questions they probably would rather not be addressing right now. Well, that's probably right. I mean, Howard Schultz didn't become a billionaire by embracing socialism. <laughs> he became a billionaire by embracing capitalism and, and turning... Uh, novelty coffee drinks into a uh, mega fortune. So the fact that that's how he made his money, I think he realizes uh, deep down that uh, soaking the rich is not necessarily the way to go here. The question is, like you said, if uh, if, if the Democratic primary voters want to hear that, they don't, which is why he's not thinking about running as a Democrat anymore. But uh, do you get the sense that the Democrats are ever going to understand that outside of their base, that this message isn't necessarily going to resonate other than they're not Donald Trump. Well, I think they're probably going to realize as soon as whoever wins the nomination is going to have to run right back to the center uh, and try to moderate a little bit. So uh, whatever they say during the primary will, might come back to bite them in some form, form or another, especially if you know the trend right now seems to be they're all just going to one after another uh, agree to promise any possible free thing or program that the people on the, you know, the far left seem to want right now. And whoever wins is going to have to backtrack from that, I would think, at least a little bit. Let's move on to our uh, bad martini now. And Kamala Harris is getting the full rollout from the media here. It's not like they're playing favorites at all. Uh, I don't remember John Delaney or Julian Castro getting an hour-long town hall. But, hey, Kamala Harris gets it from CNN in Iowa. Uh, She launched her presidential campaign on Martin Luther King Day. She had a big rollout in Oakland and 
Uh, anyway, she's getting a lot of attention, and she's probably uh, going to be in the top tier of Democratic candidates, but there's a lot of people still to get in this thing. But anyway, she has this uh, town hall with Jake Tapper uh, at Drake University in Iowa last night, and she talked about a lot of things, which showed exactly how far to the left she is. She basically said the wall is Trump's medieval vanity project. She doesn't want anything to do with private health insurance anymore. She's going full-scale socialized medicine. Uh, She also is talking gun control. Uh, She wants to ban assault weapons without defining what assault weapons are to her. Uh, She also wants universal background checks and so forth. And she's appalled that nothing happened uh, in the halls of Congress following the Newtown Elementary School shooting back in 2012. And here's her solution for lawmakers who don't want to gut the Second Amendment. I think somebody should have required all those members of Congress to go in a room, in a locked room, no press, no one, nobody else, and look at the autopsy photographs of those babies. And then you vote your conscience. It's interesting she used the word babies there, Alexandra, because you certainly jumped on that on Twitter last night uh, with the parallel to abortion. Uh, What do you make of uh, her demand for lawmakers to do that and the fact that she clearly doesn't see the, the parallel to the life issue? Well, I mean, just right off the bat, set aside the abortion thing, which, of course, is my first reaction, because that's what I'm always thinking about as a journalist. But um, even the the assumption of Harris in this quote, and presumably of a lot of people who prefer stricter gun control and don't really care about the Second Amendment very much, is this kind of bizarre idea that people who you know support the Second Amendment and favor gun rights don't know what guns do to people. OK, we know everybody knows that guns are dangerous. That's why we believe in gun rights, because we want good people who are going to defend themselves to have firearms, right? It's not, no one, uh, you know, is opposed to gun control because they don't know how terrible it is when a violent person uses guns against innocent people. So that's just a ridiculous premise. But then on top of that, you know, my first thought when I I saw this quote was, um, you know, are we going to have lawmakers locked in a room looking at the photos of aborted babies after 20 weeks before they vote on the 20 week ban in the Senate? Because I think that would change a lot of people's minds. And a lot of people who don't know much about abortion, don't know what it is, and who vote against laws like that have no idea and probably would have their hearts and minds changed by those photos in a way that people voting on gun control already know would not have their minds changed. You bring up a really good point there about how they think if you just see the emotional side of an issue, you'll see it their way. And the idea that uh, people who meet with grieving families Uh, We certainly saw it in Florida. Marco Rubio was meeting with those families. Uh, There was a school shooting a few months later in Texas, and obviously Ted Cruz and John Cornyn were down there. And they see the issue, obviously, from a different constitutional perspective. They see it as uh, the need to defend the Second Amendment. Uh, Why is it that people somehow think, I guess it's more on the left than the right, but maybe we do it sometimes as well, that if you just get a little more emotion into the equation, that somehow the constitutional prerogative or perspective is going to change here? I don't know. I mean, I think the average person looking at the issue who favors more gun control probably looks at the right as heartless and people who don't favor strict gun control as, you know, not caring about the emotional aspect of it, not caring about people. But I think the the large reason for that and for the reason that people feel that way is politicians like Kamala Harris are, you know, cynically making comments like this intentionally to make people think that if you don't favor strict gun control, it's because you don't care about mass shootings or you don't want to do anything. Or if you looked at the pictures of, you know, dead children, you wouldn't be moved by it. And I think that's intensely disgusting. What do you make of her? We've seen her a couple of years in the Senate. Uh, most, I certainly didn't know that much about her before she ran for Senate. I know she was California Attorney General, and she was certainly uh, a liberal darling out there. We've um, learned a little bit more about her now that she's running for president, but she's got this huge fanfare in, in the last week. She's clearly going hard left on every issue under the sun. Um, what do you make of her in terms of ideology as well as uh, potential in this race? I think, you know, so far, anyone in the race, I think she probably is the most formidable by quite a bit. I'm still waiting to see whether Joe Biden would get in. I'm not sure what other um, sort of big names are still considering, but uh, she definitely makes me really nervous. And I think she's as radically far left as any of the rest of them, maybe more so. But I think she has a little bit more polish and is um, a little better at coming off like she could be somewhere in the middle or like, you know, maybe I'm far left, but it's for good reason. So you should all agree with me. And that makes me uh, more nervous than the other ones do. All right, Alexander, let's move to our crazy martini now. And this is the type of story for which the crazy martini was created. Kamala Harris, of course, is from California. She is now in Washington, but there are still plenty of crazy liberals out in California. 
One of them is State Senator Hannah Beth Jackson. She is a pretty powerful member of the California State Senate. She is chairwoman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and she would be very upset with the fact that I keep calling her she. That's right. Because California has now adopted new laws defining how you can refer to people in this whole uh, transgender movement now, she's decided that you can't use gendered pronouns in committee. This clip is a little over a minute long, and she explains the new rule that she's implementing here, and then the end of this clip is just beautiful. In uh, respecting the fact that we are now a state recognizing uh, the non-binary designation uh, as a, a gender, uh, he and she, uh, we are now merging them so that we are using what my uh, grammar teacher would have had a heart attack over. We are using the phrase they um, and replacing uh, other designations so that it's a gender neutral designation of they and we've done that through most of the basically that's the primary reforms and revisions to the committee rules so um, uh, and I appreciated Senator Monning observing uh, that the chair is she but uh, in the spirit of gender neutrality for the rules of this committee it uh, now designates the chair as they um, so the world is a different place. Uh, my grammar teacher is long gone, and I won't be hearing from her. Um, and if any of you... From them. from them, exactly. From they. And so later in the hearing, uh, Jackson is going on and on about how a woman has uh, a right to do what she wants with her own body. She refers to Martin Luther King, of course, as him and his uh, I mean, this is just a torturing of the English language for absurd ends and absurd purposes here. Alexandra, where does this stop? Oh, man, I was watching this and first of all, just absolutely cracking up at the ridiculous <laughs> parallel universe they're insisting on creating uh, for the sake of political correctness. But I could hardly believe that this is the same country where I live. And then I stopped for a second and realized I live in New York City, where I'm sure it's not really very much better. <laughs> <laughs> and so where does this go? I mean, it's obvious from her own actions that you can't suddenly change what words mean and how you refer to people. I guess if you get re-educated enough that uh, you start to think about it a little more and maybe uh, you use uh, non-gender specific pronouns more often. But but to what end here? I mean, this is just nonsense. Yeah, you have to wonder if the next step will be in school. Suddenly we're going to be teaching, you know, how do you teach English grammar? Are we going to actually rewrite the codes of English grammar to account for the supposed non-binary third gender? And, it, you know, for now it's extremely confusing. I can understand, I, I don't necessarily favor this, but I could understand if there's a person on the committee, for example, who prefers the pronoun they, deferring to that, especially in a state like California, but to just impose kind of the blanket use of they and them instead of he and she in every circumstance, for obvious reasons, as demonstrated in this clip, is intensely unworkable at the very least. Absolutely. And it's pretty obvious that she identifies as a woman, which she is biologically. So why would she have a problem with people referring to her that way? It makes no sense. Yeah, the idea that we have to all identify as non-binary and solidarity with people who do is very odd. I asked this question uh, to your podcast co-host, David French, late last week when uh, the New York Times was fishing for stories on hashtag expose Christian schools, because with that hashtag, obviously, they were looking for a very balanced approach and not looking for uh, people to, to trash their Christian education at all. Uh, and I asked him whether the tradition of religious freedom in this country, how it's enshrined in the, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and the uh, surging momentum of the LGBT agenda are on a collision course that can be avoided or whether one will have to win here. What's your take? I think there's absolutely no way we can avoid a collision at this point. And a huge part of that is because I think central to the sort of left wing agenda on this point is enforcing sort of a, an umbrella code on everybody. And if you don't conform, then they see it as actively harming this community of people. And so that leaves no room for even religious liberty exemptions or any sort of understanding that people believe differently, not out of animus, not out of bigotry, but out of very deeply held, oftentimes religious convictions. And so if you don't have any room in your worldview for, for that, or you account for it as hateful, I think there's no way to resolve that. Who wins? Oh, man. I mean, <laughs> I think, you know, the Supreme Court has started trying to weave a path through some of that, but we'll have to see probably a few more cases before we know for sure. Wow. 
All right. Again, ending on a super cheery note, uh, just like we did yesterday. <laughs> Alexandra, it's always great to have you with us. Thanks for filling in for Jim, and I'm sure we'll talk soon. Yeah, great to be with you. Alexandra DeSanctis of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Jim Garrity will be back on Wednesday. Tune in then for the next Three Martini Lunch.